Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt, and uh, I'm one of the teaching pastors here. Uh, I am also a uh, co-founding pastor of Watershed. 2005, uh, September of 2005 is when Watershed had its first uh, gathering. And every, just about every year since that first year, we've, uh, we've done a series much like the one that we're in right now. It's gone through several iterations. It's evolved throughout the years in the way that we've kind of approached the conversation, even in some of the titling and branding. Um, it, and you may have heard me say this in past years, but uh, what has also been true is throughout just about all 16 of the previous years, there was always like this one weekend that was designated as like the weekend we talk about sex. And um, for reasons that still don't make a lot of sense to me, every one of those years that ended up being my task to talk about sex. I'm not sure why that evokes laughter in this space, you know? Um, but it would, it would be like, hey, uh, Matt, you know, if we do the sex talk, are you you're going to do that? And I'm here to tell you that um, I'm not going to do the sex talk, and this morning isn't about sex. Um, and so th that actually feels like a relief to me. I know for some of you, you're deeply disappointed that I will not be talking about a white 57-year-old married for 27 years old, or 27 years isn't going to be bridging that uh, topic this morning. I, I will say that um, especially the first, uh, the first eight years, uh, we didn't do a good job with this topic. There's been a lot of shifts over the last 16 years. In those first eight years, um, in the name of transparency, we wounded people. As a matter of fact, about halfway through our experience here, we had to circle back and do some uh, really uh, honest uh, interrogation about how we were coming to some of the conversations, repair with some folks, and uh, and apologize. And uh, the beauty of the story is that a lot of those folks decided to reconnect uh, here and then actually became the folks that helped us see the world in a different way. And so that's a little bit of like history. If you're brand new with us here at, at Watershed, uh, that might be helpful to hear. Um, and so I, again, the topic isn't going to be what it's normally been for me in this series. Instead, there's a different road that I, I want to try to go down. And the way to be, begin to sort of lean into some things is I, I want to look at this uh, reflective piece that's found in a part of the Bible called the New Testament. If you're, um, if you're unfamiliar with the Christian scriptures, it's like the first two thirds of the Bible are these Jewish texts that Christianity has claimed all these years. And then the last third are considered uh, like the, the Jesus scriptures. It's the church, it's these letters. Um, and it, that's called the New Testament. Um, and the excerpt that I want to draw attention to is from that part of the Bible and from uh, a leader within the church in the first century, a guy by the name of Paul. Paul was a church planter, an evangelist of sorts. He wrote most of that part of the Christian scripture. Most of the New Testament was written by Paul. And Paul, uh, in the way that he communicated, would, would often be very uh, descriptive, often prescriptive towards the church. But then every so often, every so often, it's almost like he would zoom out of whatever idea or topic he was describing or prescribing and become self-reflective. It's like he was trying to work through out loud, sort of verbally processing something that was taking place in his own life in a first century context. And so that's what I want to point you to get us started. In fact, if you guys want to go on and Oliver pull up that passage for me, um, and I want to give you some context. This is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And prior to verse 7, the first part of chapter 12, Paul begins to describe this almost kind of peculiar thing that he experienced, sort of this out-of-body, sort of lucid experience. And within the context of this, he, he feels like he, he sees some things that he'd never seen before. Uh, there's a, a bit of a revelatory nature to what he experiences. And he even talks about some other folks that he knows of that have gone through the same thing. But he's really like self-aware and doesn't want to come off as sort of like superior because of what he's experienced, even though he thinks he really has heard from the divine in all of this. He has some sort of special insight. He's, he's worried that somehow he will be interpreted as having some sort of conceit. In fact, that's actually the word he uses in verse 7 where he says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, 
I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Now, let's, let's do a little reclamation work here real, really quickly. Um, it's possible if you grew up like me that the only way to really engage parts of the, or not parts of the Bible, like most of the Bible, was through this very um, black and white, this very literal lens. Like there was literally some sort of satanic, anti-divine, monstrous, kind of invisible figure, sort of um, almost like you would see in a movie type of imaginative figure that is messing with Paul at some level, messing with his body, messing with his mind, which um, over time can have someone like feeling trapped, almost between two ends of a spectrum. The literal end of the spectrum being, all right, what do I do with this, this reality? Like if there's really demonic forces, like how do I insulate, how to protect, how to become aware of that? It's very fear-driven. The other end of the spectrum is indignation. Like if the only way for me to read this is through a literal lens, and I think all of that is just really far-fetched, then not only am I unable to hear anything Paul might have to say, but really, Matt, if you're going to talk through that lens, then I can't even hear you today. And so it's a real dualistic way of showing up to these 2,000-year-old writings, and there might be some things that would be worth hearing for you this morning. Here, here's the first thing. This term, Satan, is actually from, a, in terms of a, a way of understanding it in the first or second century, is understood to be the term the accuser. So for someone in Paul's world, if, if there was a setback, if there was an impasse, if there was an obstacle, if there was suffering or death, in the first century, the mindset was, well, clearly something is doing this to us. Something is against us. Something is being antagonistic or accusatory. There's a predator or a presence of sorts. And sometimes, literally, like the, God is doing this to us. Like God is trying to teach us a lesson. God is trying to discipline his people. Or it's not God, it's something more sinister. Let's call this something Satan. This too, Paul's world was a pre-scientific world where human consciousness was limited to a mythical worldview. It's really interesting how much speculation goes, has gone into, all right, what was Paul's thorn? He doesn't really say, you know, was it uh, some sort of sinful desire? Was it a relational problem? Was it behavior, a character flaw, a, a, like a health issue of some sort? John Dominic Crossan, who is kind of a grandfather in progressive theology, points out how much Paul spent in low-lying, swampy regions of Rome. And in these regions, it's not unusual. It wasn't unusual for there to be lots of mosquitoes. And Crossan is convinced that when Paul is talking about a thorn, he's actually talking about malaria. It's possible and probable that that was his thorn in the flesh because you can imagine, he says, getting sick and then getting well and then getting sick again and then getting well and then there being fevers and sometimes those fevers evoking lucid experience. And because science had not yet become a part of the reality of the first century, because someone might understand, oh, mosquitoes sometimes carry malaria. The only way to make sense of a thorn in the flesh is something sinister, a Satan perhaps, nefariously at play. Or maybe you just lost a fight with a mosquito. And I know that's a bit tangential, but there's a point to what I'm, where I'm going to with this. A um, couple of things. I know people show up here sometimes and say, well, does Watershed really take the Bible seriously? And the answer to that question is yes, we really take the Bible seriously. Um, but the way that we value the Bible is probably not going to look like other communities. In addition, there are five other people like me that stand up here on any given Sunday, and there's a variance for how we come into a, an understanding or a conversation around certain texts. And you might be thinking, like, how do you... How do you create clarity when there's that much variance? How, how do we all agree on what's right and what's, what's true? What's the common ground? And in this community, I think the larger question isn't like, what are all the boxes? But like, how do we love and be in community with each other knowing that there's variance, knowing that we won't agree? 
knowing that what we believe exists more on a spectrum versus a hard, defined set of absolutes. But in terms of this passage, what's the common ground? Well, the common ground is the thorn. The common ground is the shared experiences of obstacles that you can't always name, obstacles that are hard to overcome, addiction, unwanted behavior patterns, physical, mental, or emotional health thorns, the common thorn of an inner critic that insists you'll never be enough, the common thorn of a, of a broken, struggling, or wounded relationship. That's the common ground that we can experience with Paul. That's where his world starts to intersect ours. And check out his response. Three times he says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I don't know how many times that's been tattooed on somebody's body, right? And it's, it's beautiful. It is. But it's a little problematic. On the one hand, vulnerability, like acknowledging limitations or weakness, there's a courage that goes into that, Right? That's inspiring. Trusting you're enough, regardless of the inner critic, the inner accuser. That's powerful. It's, all, it's also like deeply comforting to trust or, or to believe that if something doesn't change, somehow there's a strength, there's a grace that will show up and keep me going. Where it becomes problematic is in a theology that says just pray your thorns away just pray your thorns away at least three times right I mean because we want to be at least as spiritual as Paul if God doesn't change the thorn if if nothing transitions well then I guess that's God's way of teaching you a lesson of proving a point of making you an example or testing your commitment. And of course, I, no one's going to argue that thorns don't help us see something we needed to see or hear something we needed to hear. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But in a series like this, I don't know, I, when I was thinking through some of these things, I thought it might be a good idea to point out how abusive this passage has been for some people. And how pain has flowed from the idea of just pray it away. Almost as a clobber verse on something that in the end was never a thorn. But actually this divine inspired way of someone actually being their most authentic self. And the end is actually a gift. And so if you've never heard a religious leader say what I'm about to say, first of all, it's long overdue. But if that's how you've been treated in your life growing up in the church, if you've been clobbered, um, that was wrong. That was unfair. It was unjust. And that sort of thinking doesn't exist in this space. And you're loved just as you are full stop and I don't I could probably stop right there this morning right like I think if that's all we came to this morning that would be enough um, but may I keep going all right maybe not I don't know <laughs> yes okay all right good good this is a picture of my wife uh, yeah thank you um, I, I mentioned this last weekend but uh, a couple of weekends ago Donna completed her first uh, marathon at Disney. Uh, she is now part of a community of people less than, I think it's 0.1%, is that right? Or less than 1%? Less than 
Less, less than one? You should have said point one. It sounds so much more bad, eh, you know? <laughs> Very few people. <laughs> Very few people do this, including myself. I've never done this. And for reasons that are really unclear to me, um, you know, to celebrate this major, massive life's milestone, Donna's idea of celebrating this was to attend a dinner theater experience in Walt Disney World called the Hoopty Do Review. <laughs> and... It, if you're thinking this sounds like the hokiest, cheesiest thing on the planet, you are not wrong. <laughs> this was so cheesy, and I tried really hard not to enjoy it, but it kind of grew on me. Um, who knew? I'm, I, know, I know, like you had no idea how multidimensional I can be, how talented. Um, and uh, yes, Austin, I'll play the washboard in the band. You know, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all good with that. Donna and I have been married for 27 years. Obstacles, impasses, thorns have been a part of the experience in our relationship because that's normal, right? Every relationship carries a, a, a degree of, of this. But I think what's, what's true, and I think Donna would agree with this, our, our worst moments when it comes to thorns is when we fail to separate an impasse or a thorn per se from the actual person, right? Dr. Orna Gurulik, Girl Nick, excuse me, is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst on faculty at the New York University Postdoctoral Institute for Psychoanalysis and at the National Institute for Psychotherapies in New York City, where she teaches courses on the transgenerational transmission of trauma, sociopolitical ideology, and psychoanalysis, and on disassociation. Uh, so she's got a few things going on, right? Um, and if her name happens to sound familiar, then it, it's possible... Uh, you've maybe heard of or watched the Showtime docuseries Couples Therapy, where she's the featured therapist. But Dr. Gerlinick uh, frames thorns, pat, uh, impasses, uh, and obstacles in relationships as, quote, otherness. And she says, we don't connect to our partners to find ourselves. And let me stop there. Like, there's probably many of us who would say, well, no, of course we don't. And most of us would be lying, right? Um, but she says, there's no growth. There's nothing new to be had in ordering relationships where we seek a version of ourselves or we seek to complete ourselves this way. She goes on to say, reaching out to the world and inviting love is by definition inviting otherness. That is the thorn that will make you grow. And she describes how relationships often get trapped in sort of this these cycles of scorekeeping and competition, they're evangelistic, evangelistic, evangelical, evangel, evangel, <laughs> conversion. There we go. That's the word I was, conversion focused. Uh, I'm going to convert you to my way of thinking. But relationships, she says, are more like many political systems. And so she begins to pontificate around what it looks like to uh, democratize your relationships? What type of political system do you believe in when it comes to how we experience otherness? What are your ethnics, or ethics rather, about difference, differences? Do you squash difference or do you open yourself up to difference? What are your fears that quietly inform how you encounter otherness? How do you live well with difference? Is there a third way? What is the third way? And so I want to try to, in my remaining time here, oh, really? Oh, oh thank you. Um, uh, I want to spend just a few moments trying to kind of give some language to this. And to be clear, I'm still getting my head wrapped around it, but it, it was just so good I thought it was worth including. The first thing I think might be worth hearing is every single one of us have been indoctrinated in how we deal with difference. 
And so in other words, if you grew up indoctrinated uh, in systems or with, through systems that seek to harmonize, right, you'll seek to harmonize otherness. Unfortunately, that's how most of us probably didn't grow up. A lot of us, most of us potentially grew up in religious, political, or familiar systems that actually use distinction as a weapon at times, a way of including or excluding, sometimes even oppressing. What am I? What am I not? Who is better? Who, um, who deserves the status, the power? Who's entitled? And we can all say, you know, philosophically, that's not me. Like, that's the old me. That's not who we are anymore. And we can kind of say that together. In fact, the first part of this was me saying, that's not who we are, but it's still naive. The long-term effects on our limbic system of being neurologically conditioned within these types of systems doesn't just vanish overnight. It literally is carried into our lives, into our unconscious, and then sometimes subversively informs the way that we show up to the world. Hence, our experience with otherness, with difference, feeling like a thorn. Dr. Girl and Nick suggest, though, every experience with otherness, every encounter with difference doesn't have to be like a thorn, but actually it's more like a riddle. Our default is to treat it like a thorn, but then we start to do something that's called splitting. And we take that encounter or that obstruction and we put it into a binary place and we try to distinguish between the good and the bad. And, and then essentially, in that process, we've tried to project the good, or excuse me, persevere in the good, but then project the bad. And so, for instance, splitting says things like this. It says only women suffer from patriarchy. But that's only partially true. Men also suffer from patriarchy as well, which sounds counterintuitive, right? But patriarchy is more than just a system that oppresses women. Patriarchy insists that men show up in a very defined, confined set of masculine ideas or roles and splitting off anything within themselves that could even remotely be considered a part of the feminine. And the converse is also true. While patriarchy oppresses women, it also insists that women split off anything that might resemble any sort of inner masculinity. And essentially, splitting says things like, you're a girl, act this way. You're a guy, act this way. You're white. You're a person of color, act this way. Uh, you're divorced. You're single. You're married. You're like, act a particular way. You're Christian, so act this way. By the way, it, if I can just kind of be a little vulnerable for a moment, if you identify as he or him, if you're a man, it would make sense, especially over the last several to numerous years, to live with some degree of confusion around this. And I'm speaking out of experience as well. Because when you're no longer asked or expected to simply exist in the more traditional lanes, traditional lanes of max masculinity, to be clear, like it's, it's not as simple as just being a breadwinner or a dominant or be tough on the exterior. It's like all the coordinates start to get mangled up, get, get like confused, scrambled, and still there's this pressure to perform. But, but what does that even mean? And I, I, I don't know how that's impacted those of you who identify as he, him, man, male, whatever the case may be. But it's, it would make sense if it's been hard. Um, for me, there's a bit of insecurity around this. Um, feeling like I'm on my heels at, at times. Not really confident in showing up. Not wanting to harm someone. But also feeling as though I, if, if I say something incorrectly, I, I might get it wrong. Right? Not, an, not always knowing what I think. Uh, and I'm an Enneagram 9, so that's happening on steroids like all the time to begin with. Not really sure what I believe about who I am as a man. And so that kind of brings me back to splitting. Patriarchal normalcy causes 
me to disassociate with parts of myself, disavow parts of myself. And when this happens, and this is universally true when we're talking about just splitting in general, when we lose track of ourselves, when we become afraid, often that fear compels us to see whatever we've pushed aside or pushed down in the other, in this other person. And so maybe we attempt to control what we see in the other. Maybe we punish or dismiss what we see in the other. Another example of this might be someone splitting off from ambition. Like you used to be really ambitious or you had ambitious parts of yourself, but because of the culture you were raised in, the family, the environment, the systemic culture where you exist, you push that down or that got pushed down. It got oppressed or suppressed. And now when you see it being on full display somewhere else and someone else, you punish, you're cynical, you're critical. Another example could be men who squash their femininity, feeling the need or the right or the entitlement to bully or to ridicule someone who is effeminate, which is really just homophobia. Boy, a lot of pins could drop right now, right? Splitting, seeing the other as a thorn versus a riddle. This is our default system. So can we scramble the system a little bit? How do we do that? I know Sean spoke last weekend about love, which is always the best place to start, right? And can I suggest that love is how we scramble the system? And I'm not necessarily talking about just like a, a loving response, but more like a counterintuitive expression of love. Um, and love that is like counterintuitive, it kind of leans into something or makes me think of something called paradoxical intervention. Have you, have you ever heard of this? This is fascinating. It's, it's from the cognitive therapy world. And again, I'm not a licensed therapist and I don't play one on TV. So you should probably run this by someone who is. But the idea behind paradoxical intervention is doing the opposite of the thing that you ultimately think is going to happen. So say like the thorn might be finances between you and the person that you love. Let's say you're hoping they would take more responsibility for the finances. Well, paradoxically, tell them to spend as much money as possible. Now, hold on just a second, because I know that, I, like, I, that made me, like, I, I'm like, what? The first time I heard that. Um, so, again, this is why you need to run this by a, a professional and not just take the word of some guy on stage, which is true for anything I say for the record. Um, but the idea is that you're scrambling the system and breaking some one or something out of patterns where the, the other thing, other things get evoked and opposites start to emerge. All right. Again, that sounds really scary. It, when we were talking about money for some reason, there's probably a whole capitalistic conversation we could have there. Right. Uh, but another less dramatic example could be, let's say if your spouse isn't keeping her side of the bathroom sink straight and it's like just clutter and then that clutter kind of bleeds into your side and the whole thing is then cluttered and then instead of like complaining or shutting down or becoming passive aggressive you go up to Donna and you hug her <laughs> you tell her she's wonderful because she is and how much you appreciate her because you do it's the opposite and you, it ends up being a win-win, actually. You're released from the need to control. You're released from your frustration. And Donna won't have to forget to put her shoes away as a way of punishing you for withholding her, your love. Like they, it win, everybody wins. Everybody wins. This too. This too. A healthy, built-in suspicion of splitting scrambles the system. So we just spend a lot of time talking about splitting but how do you create like, a, a, like this ongoing muscle that is always going, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, is that splitting? And this is where I think spiritual practices really become important. Meditation, breath work, grounding yourself, um, detaching from your emotions, silent prayer, spiritual practices that go a long way in building stamina and aptitude to be able to, to notice something. 
to, to like pause, to create some sort of space for you to like have some sort of experience and go, wait a minute, am I going to treat it as a thorn or is this the riddle? What's the thing under the thing? Um, in his book, My Grandmother's Hands, which I haven't read, but that's on my uh, 2023 reading list. Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. It's by Resma Menachem. And I, I've read a, enough about this book um, to know that Menachem describes how generational trauma, especially in this book, racism as trauma, is passed down generations, or generationally rather. And it's not just passed down through families or communities who have been oppressed, but literally everybody, every community. And again, it's our, our tendency to split and say, well, only this group of people have had that experience. But oppression like functions as this mustard seed that's embodied at a cellular level in everyone. It's, it's a part of our culture within the United States and the world that is, has constantly been informing, uh, informing us at a, at a bodily level. My therapist and I have just started kind of at a cursory level, kind of leaning into some of this. But I wanted to mention it, first of all, because it's a thing under the thing. But also, uh, there was an event here last night, and about 200 people showed up. It was ICU talks. I know How many of you were there last night? Shoot a hand up. A few of you, Yeah. Um, ICU Talks is a mental health ministry. It's, it was founded by Kim Honeycutt, who's one of our teaching pastors here. And um, for numerous reasons, that's like really important work. But it's also why mental health is also an issue of social justice. Like there's something that informs the way we show up at the deepest place of ourself. How do you start to see these layered experiences with others? That's, that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about scrambling the system. What you see is what you get is a lie. <laughs> this is a bold-faced lie. There's always a thing under the thing under the thing. And if we can't see the thing under the thing, right? Or if you or I have no awareness that something could be true that's unseen, then when you treat something like a thorn... What you're really doing is dehumanizing. You're dehumanizing this person and even yourself at some level. And so how do you scramble the system? What does a built-in suspicion of splitting look like? Which brings me back to our friend Paul, verbally processing out loud. There's this thorn in my flesh. I have begged God to take it away. And three times I, I asked God to do this. And somehow Paul trusted in his first century mindset that there was something bigger than himself, something more loving, more forgiving, more accepting, more validating that would be enough for him. That he could get through this. And I think that's really important to end on this morning, you know? Because no matter how much we're able to scramble the system, no matter how much we love counterintuitively, no matter how much we develop a healthy degree of skepticism or suspicion around splitting, an embedded thorn is still painful. It's just hard. And knowing and trusting that there is grace that is really essential. And it's one thing to trust that that's really true. You can put that on a tattoo, a bumper sticker, or a, a meme, but until it is embodied in flesh and blood, it's just words. Until you have that experience, until you're willing to be that for someone, and until you're willing to let someone be that for you, our experience with grace is more like a pithy statement than reality. And so, God, this morning, thank you, first of all, 
for animating grace in this community. It is not unusual for me to hear someone say in a very short period of time, I was there and it felt like I had just come home and I didn't even know I needed a home. That's grace. There's something about the people there that just makes me feel incredibly welcome and invited. That's grace. I went through this thing and I was expecting backlash and I was met with mirrored vulnerability, mirrored curiosity. And God, as we try to make sense of the complexity and beauty and pain in relationships, as we work, do the work of dislodging thorns of scrambling systems, may we live well together in the midst of all. May we, like Paul, trust in something transcendent. May we trust a spirit of Christ that animates our love and our grace, not just for ourselves, but for one another. As we continue together, awakening, struggling, and loving as though a different world is possible today. Amen.